Welcome back to this week's teaching on no man, knowing no man after the flesh. Now, this is a very misused verse, and often it's used to um, cover up or sort of get away with murder, so to speak, with, with wrong behavior, excuse wrong behavior. And, and people say, well, you know, you can't know me after the flesh. I've even heard people have said, you know, I know you're still carnal because you still know me after the flesh. Okay. So that means you can do a whole bunch of wrong. And if I, you know, confront you on it, which the Bible says to do many times, it actually says to do that. I'm carnal because I'm doing what the Bible says. No, you're trying to cover up the wrong that you're doing, saying you're carnal if you know me after the flesh. But the Bible clearly says, if you see a brother in a fault, you who is spiritual, go correct a brother, considering yourself, lest you fall into the same temptation. Talks about that in James. So if it's a spiritual thing to do, if you go to a brother in love um, with, with proper you know, church etiquette and going there and correcting a brother. You see, so people use that to get away with all sorts of things and say, you can't know me after the flesh. Well, that's not really what the Bible means. So let's have a look at this verse, or these sets of verses. So 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 21. We're going to go a long way through this. We've got a lot of scripture to go through today, um, and hopefully we can get it done in, in one teaching. But 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 6. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent with the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Instead, say that we are confident and willing to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So whether present or absent, we labor that we may be accepted by him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We all. Who is he talking to? the church. What are we going to be judged for? We're going to be judged for how we lived. We're going to be judged for every word that we've spoken, our, our thoughts, our actions, what we've done in the flesh, things like that. But if we're not supposed to know no man after the flesh, like so many people preach it, then what are we going to be judged for? We're going to be judged, judged by our deeds that we do in the flesh. Do you see? So what is God judging then? So if we're not to know no man after the flesh, then God can't know us after the flesh. Okay. See, here's the thing. A lot of people think that once you're saved, you, you can't sin anymore as a Christian, that, that sin doesn't really matter anymore because, uh, God's forgiven, uh, sin past, present, and future. There is no scripture that says God has forgiven sins past, present, and future. Yes. God has provided forgiveness for sins of the past, sins of the present and sins of the future, but it is not automatic. And people think that they, they can just get away with everything and, and that there's no conditions to, to salvation, no conditions to anything. Yes, there is. And I'll be preaching on the fact that God's uh, promises are conditional. So stay tuned for that. But it says we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive a recompense in the body according to what he has done. Really? Hmm, interesting. Whether it is good or bad. So we're appearing before the judgment seat of Christ for what? For what we've done and we'll receive recompense for that, whether good or bad. So what is that? That is knowing a man after the flesh in a way. But I've heard people say this, well, you can't, I, you know, I make a lot of mistakes in my life and, and, you know, that's just the way I am. And you can't know me after the flesh because you're carnal, you know, and people preach that from the pulpit and it's not true. They're doing it to get away with uh, wrongdoing because I'm God's anointed. You can't touch God's anointed. Okay, that's another one we're going to be hitting because that's a bunch of nonsense too, the way certain people, a lot, a lot of people preach it. A lot of times this stuff is preached so they can cover up their nonsense. That's just the truth. Bridget and I have been around the ministry for 30 years. We've seen a lot of people do a lot of stupid things um, and, and we won't be part of it. So that's just the way it goes. So again, verse 10, for we, for must all, we must all, all, we, who, the church, everybody must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive his recompense in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Verse 11, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, if you look in the, uh, and, and other translations, I think it is even in the King James, it says, knowing the terror of the Lord. 
Therefore, be, therefore what? Therefore, because you're going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ and receive recompense in, in the body, whether good or bad, therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord. The terror of the Lord what? He who has the power to put you in heaven or put you in hell. Do, do you see? Do, that's what this is talking about. You know, and people, well, we don't fear God. Yes, you do. Check out my book on two kinds of fear and my teaching on the fear of the Lord. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, but in other translations, again, it's terror. Be terrified that you might go to hell. <laughs> All right. You know, we've almost made, you know, jokes about it. A lot of people make jokes about it. Well, you know, I won't be bored in hell because all my friends will be there. Listen, friends, you don't want to go there. You want nothing to do with that place. You think earth is bad? Wait till you get over on that side of the things. You don't want to be there. So verse 11, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Persuade men what? Verse 10, you see? But we are revealed to God, and I trust that we are also revealed in your consciousness. For we are not commending ourselves again to you. Instead, we give occasion to boast on our behalf that you may have something to answer to those who boast in appearance and not in heart. It's always about the heart. If we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are right in our mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all have died. And he died for all that those who live should not from now on live for themselves. What do you mean? Living after the flesh. D do you see? For bef but for him who died for them and rose again. This is what I read all that to get to this verse. Verse 16 of 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. So from now on, we do not regard anyone after the flesh. Yes, though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet we do not regard him as such from now on. That's where people get hung up and they say, we are to know no man after the flesh. No matter what he does, no matter what he says, we can know no man after the flesh. We got to turn the blind eye to it. It, it. It's only the message that counts. It's not the messenger that counts. And I'll be doing a message on that as well. That a lot of people say, listen, as long as I'm speaking truth, it doesn't matter how I live whatsoever. Well, that's not true. I've heard people say all the righteousness. Um, actually, I got to correct that. I didn't hear them say that. I heard other people whom I trust dearly hear, hear them say that. That they say that particular people said that all the righteousness I've done for the body of Christ, all the right things I've done for the body of Christ, um, that will negate any wrong that I do. Man, I wish God knew that. Just God, God just didn't get the memo on that, I suppose. Because in Ezekiel chapter 3, it actually says that if a righteous... You can look at Ezekiel chapter 3, that if a, a righteous person sins, then somebody needs to warn them that they will die in their sin. And if they don't warn them, I hold it against you and the blood will be on your hands and things like that. But it says the righteousness that they have done, who? The righteous that they have done will not be remembered. Isn't that amazing? Now, I know that the Bible says many times that uh, your sins and iniquities I'll remember no more. As far as the east is from the west, I cast them away and drown them in the sea and all those different things. But this also says in Ezekiel chapter 3 that... I will not remember the righteousness of that person who's gone from righteousness back to being a sinner and living in sin and, and willfully, habitually doing wrong. I won't remember their righteousness. So, so much for the person that says, well, I've done so much right that it just negates all the wrong that I'm going to do or I have done. Absolute fallacy. What is that? It's just trying to trick people into making them think they're a wonderful person. Now, from now on, we do not regard anyone according to the flesh. What this means is we don't look at them for their stature, whether they're rich, whether they're poor, whether they're um, male or female, whether they are educated, not educated, whether they're articulate, not articulate. I mean, all these different things. We are to know no man after the flesh. Why? Because in Christ Jesus, everybody is one. 
Do you see? So whether one is rich or poor, um, smart or not so smart, um, educated or not educated, we are to know no man after the flesh. This has nothing to do with a, a current lifestyle of sin and, and, and being some sort of a reprobate. And, and well, we just got to turn our blind eye to it. Why? Because they're famous, they're popular, they're my boss, they have a big ministry. We got to keep the word of God going. This is the word of God and you can keep the word of God going. Why anybody would remain in, in, a, in, a, in a terrible sort of ministry that's run like a bunch of devils, I got no idea. I, I, you know, Bridget, I've seen it throughout the years. Like I said, I have no idea why people do that. Why? Because you become responsible for it. It's very clear in Ezekiel chapter three and other places that you become responsible for what you see, know, and, and don't do anything about. The Bible tells us many times in, in Mark chapter 18 and in, in Timothy and all these different places in what to do in this, in this situation. Now, I understand that, and we can take this a little bit further, actually, too, and say, okay, well, if a person was, was a, a terrible person, like a lot of people were when they came to Christ, they, we've all done wrong and fallen short of the glory of God, we, we know that. When we come into Christ, as we'll see in just a moment here, when we come into Christ, we should not be known for what we have done, but we will certainly be known for what we do. Do, do you see the difference? So this in, in context is talking about not knowing a man after the flesh and all those different things that I said, but we should also, like if we have, if we have uh, Bill and Bill's been a bad dude and, and Bill comes in and, and we, we, we tell him that, hey, listen, you're going to go before the judgment seat of Christ and we persuade him and, and we, we convince us of, 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 of God's mercy and grace and Bill says, you know what? I want this. I'm done with my life. I'm going to give my life to Christ. I want Christ to come into my life. I want him to be the Lord of my life. From that moment, Bill has stepped into a new life. Why? Verse 17, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. New creature. So we should not know Bill for what he's done. We should walk with Bill now for who he is and who he's going to be and who he's going to be become. So I get there's an essence of, of not knowing a man after the flesh for what he was, but we certainly would know them for who they are now. You see, because he's a new creation. Old, old things have passed away. All those old things are completely supposed to pass away. It doesn't mean you can still live by them. Oh, but nobody can know me after the flesh. Do you, do you see how wrong that is and how people use it to twist and manipulate to just get away with whatever they want? Not true. Listen, I get, you know, it's, it, it's not easy to always do the right thing and to always have the right attitude and to, 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 to always, you know, do good to those who despitefully use you and things like that. Okay, that you know, sometimes if you have a hard time and you got to grit your teeth and you do it anyway, that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about a person who, who is a hypocrite, who is, who is, who is an actor, basically, who uses this, these scriptures to say, well, you can't know me after the flesh. I can't emphasize that enough. I've heard it way too many times. Now, verse 17 again, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Look, all things have become new. All this is from God. Okay, all things have become new. So what? We're going to know him after the newness of life and walk with Bill and help Bill and all these. I'm sorry if your name is Bill, but, you know, all these different things. Um, and uh, so all this is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them and is entrusted us to the message of reconciliation. So we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you in Christ's stead, Christ's place, be reconciled with God. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might be, become the righteousness of God in him. So this whole thing is talking about um, getting, getting to know the Lord, walking with the Lord. We walk by faith and not by sight. Um, we're absent with the Lord. Um, uh, uh, to be absent from the, the Lord in body is to be, pr to be present with the Lord. So whether we're present or absent, we labor to be accepted by him. Again, talking about the judgment seat of Christ, okay? Whether good or bad, therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, I know I'm recapping on this, but it's very important. Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. To persuade men what? Stay out of sin. It's not a matter of coming to Christ and then just stay sinning. No, that's not true. Or live however you want. That's not true. Why? Because you can't know me after the flesh. 
Do you, do you see how this all ties into this? Why can't we note somebody after the flesh? Because all are in one in Christ Jesus. No fail, male, no female, no Greek, no Jew. We are all one in Christ Jesus. So we can't know a man in the flesh after his, his stature in life, his uh, male, female, educated, on all those things that I covered. We are to know no man after the flesh in that regard. This has nothing to do with just turning a blind eye to a, a man or a woman, a man of God, a woman of God, a priest teacher, pastor, head of a ministry, whatever the case may be, uh, we can't know them after the flesh. Why? They're God's anointed. They're, they're, listen, God knows that. That's where we're going to, Paul was saying it. We're going to look at a few things. I was going to get ahead of myself, but we're going to look at a few things. So, um, now we're going to look at Romans 1, uh, 8, sorry, Romans 8, 1 through 17. Talking about the flesh. If the flesh doesn't matter... Why do we have so much about it? If we're not to know anybody after the flesh, then why can't we live after the flesh? Do you see? Romans 8, verse 1. Therefore, or there, there is no, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So there's no condemnation to those who walk in the Spirit. Not If you're walking in the flesh, there's going to be a level of condemnation. Why? Because you're going to self-condemn. Your conscience is going to condemn you, okay? Uh, that's really where conviction comes from as well, is in your conscience. Your conscience will condemn you and convict you in, in wrongdoing, okay? Now, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and concerning sin. See, if sin doesn't matter anymore, why is there so much talk about it? If, if we're not to know any man after the flesh, and they can just do whatever they want, um, and, and sin doesn't really, well, I know he's, he, he does this and he does this, or she does this and she does that, whatever, but, you know, we can't really know them after the flesh because that's what the Bible says. Then what was Paul talking about? I... Maybe we should just rip all that sin stuff right out of the Bible. Anyway, uh, and, the, uh, and concerning sin, he condemn, get, condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk according, uh, not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Verse five, for those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh. What is that? What is, what is one of the number one things on this is the love of money. I'm, I'm writing a financial manual right now on the love of money. And there's a lot of things that I found out um, in the, you know, that people preach and things that just actually aren't accurate. And I'll be putting those in the manual. But one of those things that people set their minds on in, in the world and even in ministry is the love of money. It, it, people have learned how to manipulate people for money majorly. Um, I, I could say that we've got some massive project that we want to do, and it, this giant, enormous thing that's going to save the whole world and, and be the greatest thing since sliced bread, and people will start sending money into it. And, and just you know, a year, two years pass or something like that. And I just, I just dangle that hook or that, 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 that bait once again. Oh, you know, we're, we're, praise God. We're just waiting for God to do this and waiting for God to do this. And all the piece puzzles together, the pieces of the puzzle to come together and all this other kind of stuff. And people, oh, I want to be part of that. So they start sending money on whatever. And there's never a move towards it. But what happens? All the money keeps running in. You know, uh, it's, it's incredible. So that's how people end up manipulating other people for money. It's, it's, it, 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 people have become very masterful and skillful at it. Now, some people are just more bold and, and uh, you know, they just basically scare you into giving money. But anyway, that's another story. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. For the carnal mind is hostile towards God and is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's amazing, okay? You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. Now, if any man does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Do you see that? Everybody goes along and they say, well, we're all children of God. That is not true. You're a child of God if you've been adopted by the Spirit of adoption into Christ Jesus. If you're not, you're not. 
It's just as simple as that. If you do not have Christ in you, you are not a child of God. You're a child of the devil. So we got to stop lying to people. And well, I don't do it, but going to people and say, well, you're a child of God. They're living like the devil. They're not a child of God. Or they're a child of their father. Jesus even said that to the religious people, to the Pharisees. You are like your father, the devil. Okay. And you're going to do his will, he says. Now, I know this isn't, you know, feel good preaching, but uh, that's just the way it is. All right. Um, we're trying to, trying to get people to life, not live in some sort of a, a mamsy pamsy false Christianity. All right. Now, um, yeah, verse 10. And if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give your mortal bodies, your life to your mortal bodies through his spirit that lives in you. Verse 12. Therefore, brothers, who's he speaking to? Christians. We are not debtors after uh, to the flesh to live according to the flesh. So if, if we're not to know man, any man after the flesh, then, then why is Paul talking about to his brothers, to Christians? We're not to live after the flesh. Why didn't he say, we're not debtors to the flesh, but, hey, you know, I, I really can't know you after the flesh. Um, so, you know, I, I, just, I just can't do that. So hey, live however you want. It's no big deal. God's got unconditional grace. No problem. Unconditional grace is not biblical, by the way. Okay? Now, for if you... Now, nah, I better preface that because someone's going to jump all over that. Okay. God's unconditional grace. He offers grace to anybody in the world, but you need to come into that grace, right? He offers it. It's, it's here. It's, a, it's an offer, all right? Uh, lots of times in your email, you get, a, you get an email that says, you know, this bank or that bank has, has offered you and, and pre-qualified you or pre-approved you for this particular credit card. Okay, and you can have X amount of dollars, and all you have to do is push this button or whatever, and you got this credit card. Okay, that is sort of an offer that's been offered to you. But if you don't take it, it's not given to you. So this is what I mean by God's grace is not unconditional. You can you can walk away from the grace of God. You could take the grace of God in vain and walking in it. So it's not unconditional in the sense of you come into it and, and how you live, it doesn't matter because you're under this unconditional grace of God. That is false. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, now. Um, for, verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if through the spirit put to, put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. What's that talking about? The flesh. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For if you have not received the Spirit, uh, you have not received the Spirit of slavery again to fear, but you have re received the Spirit of adoption by where we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Okay, so not everybody, those who accepted Him, that have the Spirit of God in them, and if children. Then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified with him. So if the flesh doesn't matter, why is there so much talking about the flesh? Listen, we are not to be debtors after the flesh, to live according to the flesh, okay? Uh, we'll be judged for what's in our flesh. We'll be dud, uh, given recompense, as we looked at earlier, for the deeds we've done, both good or bad, all right? Now, Galatians 5, 16 through 26 I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are in opposition to one another, so you may not do the things that you please. Now, this doesn't mean some sort of uh, internal battle between your soul and, and, and the Spirit that'll never be, that'll never uh, depart. It'll always, you'll always be battling with the good and the bad that's in you, the yin and the yang and the thing and all that other kind of stuff. That's not what this is talking about. Paul was talking to them about, you're, you're trying to go back under the law. What are you doing? Don't, don't do that. If you, if you walk in the spirit, don't try to get righteous by living under the law. If you walk in the spirit, you're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh and going after those different things. Okay. So it's not just really speaking about that battle that's never ending between your soul and your, and your spirit. And you're always going to be in turmoil and never have peace. That's not what it's really speaking about, okay? Um, these are in opposition to one another. You may not do the things that you, you please, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. See? That's, that's what I was just saying. Verse 19. For the works of the flesh are revealed. These are works of the flesh. Which are these? 
idolatry, sexual immorality, impurity, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, rage, selfishness, dissensions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. I warn you, as I've previously warned you, I've told you guys this before. Why are you not listening to me? He's saying that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because of work of the flesh. How is that any different now? It's not any different. That is still for today. That is still for the church. 100%, hands down. Paul didn't say, listen, now you, you, you shouldn't do these things, but I'm to know no man after the flesh. No, if you do these things in the flesh, the works of the flesh, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's what it says. But again, people use 2 Corinthians 5.16, therefore from now on we know no man after the flesh, to say, um, well, you, this is just who I am, there's nothing you can do about it. And then the people that, that sit with them, sit under them, train by them, work for them, whatever the case may be, they use the same sort of thing. Well, you know, I'd like to say something, and I see a lot of wrong here, but I just, you know, the Bible says to know no man after the flesh. Yeah, read it in context, okay? All right. Ephesians 5, 1 through 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. I don't, I'm going to stop there for a second. I don't know if you guys have noticed or not, but there's a lot of big name ministers that are actually uh, resigning, being found out uh, in, in moral failure, uh, lying, cheating, stealing, doing all these different things. And it seems, though, as God is cleaning his house, you know, um, but if we're not supposed to know no man after the flesh, then why is that happening? These, these aren't businesses. This is, these are ministries and churches for the living God. Like if you, if you run a business, run the business any way you want, but don't put God into it, okay? Because that's where the, you become a hypocrite, all right? Now, Ephesians 5, 1 through 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Verse 3. And do not let sexual immorality or any impurity or greed be named among you as these are not proper among the saints. So we know he's talking to the church. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse joking, which are not fitting. Instead, give thanks for this you know that no sexually immoral or impure person or one who is greedy, all right, who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of God and of God. Christ. Do you see that? What is it talking about? It's talking about deeds of the flesh. If you do these things, if you're greedy, if you're impure, if you're sexually immoral, if you do all these different things, as it says in, in Galatians chapter 5 as well, you will not inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. You know what's amazing? You, you know that eternal life is actually only promised to the overcomer? Do you, do you see that? The overcomer, I, I just, in one of my manuals I'm just putting out, um, uh, I can't remember which one it is actually, but there's a lot of things. Um, I think it's the, the body and the bride manual I'm putting out right now. Uh, I talk about what's pro a promise to the overcomer. Eternal life is only promised to the overcomer, not to the decision maker. Okay. Um, overcoming what? All these things. Because this world is trying to pull you down all the time simply saying a prayer, raising your hand, or believing that Jesus was, was the Messiah does, does not guarantee you any kind of salvation. None whatsoever. It's only promised to the overcomer, right? Matthew 24, 13, and other places says, those who endure till the end shall be saved. Enduring and overcoming are, are keys, and the major keys to actually spending eternity with God, all right? But you need to study that out. Colossians 3, 1 through 15. Like I said, we got a lot of scripture to look through. If you then were raised with Christ, desire those things which are above, which Christ sits at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not things on earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ uh, in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then you will appear with him in glory. Therefore, or because of that, because your life is hidden with Christ, because you've died, because you, 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 you died with Christ and you were risen with Christ, because you've set your affection on things on, on, in heaven and not on earth, because of that, or therefore, verse 5, put to death the parts of your earthly nature, the flesh. What's that? Here it is again. Sexual immorality, 
uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of the, listen, people can actually covet other people's ministries. There, there, there is people who will will see a, uh, a massively known minister who's worth hundreds of millions or a billion dollars or whatever these guys are worth. I'm not sure. And and they will set themselves after that. Um, and I want to be like them. Why? Because of their massive ministry, their massive amounts of money, all that kind of stuff. And though people will deny that, they secretly desire it in their heart. And they send, you know, spies into different ministries to spy out how they're doing this, to spy out how they're doing that. And it's it's just, it, it's a ridiculous thing. Uh, and, and, you know, we we know these things firsthand, okay? Just love God, love people, do what's right, be... be um, content with where God has you in the moment, build what you got to build. God will build this church. Keep moving forward. Keep righteous. Keep holy. And God will exalt that. God will build that. Don't build your own kingdom. Okay. Anyway, it's a warning. Oh, hang on. Uh, yeah. So therefore put to death all these things evil desires, covetousness, which is adultery. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience. Isn't that amazing? You also walked in these when you lived in them, but now you must also put away all these, these, okay? What? Fleshly things. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old nature with its deeds. So if you're lying and cheating and stealing, you're operating under the old nature, which is what? The flesh. And have embraced the new nature, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him who created it. Wherefore, there is, this is what we were getting to before, not knowing any man after the flesh. Wherefore, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Meaning all what? All the people that have given their life to him and all that kind of stuff, okay? That's what that's talking about. It is not saying, no, no man after the flesh, I can do what I want, get away with what I want, treat people the way I want, and you can't know me after the flesh because that's what the Bible says. We are going to know people after the flesh because if they're operating in the flesh, that's how you're going to know them. Do you see? This isn't saying, this isn't a license to get away with sin. And people say, well, I can't know no man after the flesh. If that's true, then we need to take all the scriptures that talk about correcting a brother and throw him in the garbage. And I heard one person say, and it's an idiotic thing to say, that no brother can correct a brother. There's so much the Bible says about a brother correcting a brother, okay? It's just people who want to get away with wrongdoing. It's just, it, 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 it's a frustrating thing, believe me. It, it very much is a frustrating thing. Because all these people want that, that operate like this, they, they want to use God as a way to promote themselves. God as a way to get themselves rich and become famous and all these different things. Listen, a lot of people, again, want to have you know, giant ministries. And I'm not against someone having a giant ministry, but why? Why? I am not against a pastor, a preacher, a ministry, a minister, Christian, whatever, having money. But how did you get it? Why do you want it? And what are you doing with it? That's what I have a problem with. Okay. Now I've seen a lot of disgusting thing, things when it comes to the money in that sense. Right. So, uh, verse 12. So embrace as the elect of God, holy and beloved, a spirit of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long suffering. Bear with one another and forgive one another. As anyone has quarrel against anyone, if anyone has quarrel against anyone, even as Christ forgave you, so you must do. Forgiveness is not an option for a Christian. Verse 14, and above all these things, embrace love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God to which you were called into one body rule in your hearts and be thankful. So what is this saying? Put to death your flesh these different things. Why? Because if you don't, it's the same as Ephesians 5, Galatians 5, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But if we're not to know any man after the flesh, then why is all this in here? In, in, in the context of how it's preached by a lot of people. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 
It is actually commonly reported that there is sexual immorality among you. Do you see how much sexual immorality this has to, the Bible talks about? This is just a few of them, actually. And such immorality is not even named in the world, in the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife, but you are arrogant. So <laughs> it's, it's funny because in Christian circles today, everybody just wants to get along and, and sing kumbaya together and just sweep everything under the rug and, and you don't call anybody out, you don't, you don't hold anybody accountable, you don't do any of these other things. And that's why there's so much rampant sin in the church and, and a church leader or something can, can get away with all sorts of things because we just, you know, we just want to get together and, and, and as long as we're doing church, it's pleasing God. As long as I show up to church, God is happy with me. No, you can show up to church in the flesh. Absolutely. But look what, look what Paul said. Listen, there is people in your church. There's a man in your church that is doing stuff that's not even named out there. And you didn't do anything about it. You are arrogant, he says in verse 2. Instead, you should have mourned so that he who has done this deed might be removed from you. For indeed, though absent in the body, but in present in spirit, I have already, if I were, as if I were present, judged who has done this deed. Hmm, interesting. I thought we weren't supposed to judge anybody. Again, Paul didn't get the memo. I mean, this, this guy, he's, he did his best, but I have judged him already who has done this deed. Isn't that interesting? In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? When you are assembled along with my spirit, in the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Hmm. Why doesn't it say, when you are assembled together along with my spirit, in the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, don't worry about it because we're not to know no man after the flesh. It doesn't say that. What does it say? Deliver him to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Now, I go into greater detail on this in my uh, other teaching on church discipline and things that I did a few months back, so you, can, you could look at that. But in this case, this, what this meant is turn this guy right over for the destruction of the flesh. Don't excommunicate him from the church. Don't keep company with him. And don't even pray for him. Isn't that amazing? Why? Why deliver him to Satan for the destruction of the flesh? So that the spirit, or his spirit, may be saved on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a reason for this. Not just because we, we hate this guy and we got to get him out of here, but to turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. So his, his, he, he gets to his rock bottom and comes back to God so his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 6. Now he goes into scolding him even more. Your boasting is not good. You're boasting about all these gifts and all these things that you're doing. You've got all this prophecy and you've got all these things that, are, that God is doing in your church. But you've got this thing in you that you're not even willing to deal with. Why? Maybe we just got to fill up the church because the more people we get in the church, the happier God is. That is simply not true. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch? Therefore, or because of that, purge out the old yeast that you may be a new batch since you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old yeast, nor with the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote you in a letter, in my letter, not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Wow, isn't that amazing? Do you see that? And look, he goes on. Look, look, at, look at the separation here in this. Yet I did not mean the sexually immoral people of this world. Do you see? Why? Because who's going to reach them? Right? But you certainly don't do what they're doing. Or the covenant. So I wrote you in my letter not to keep coming to you sexually immoral people. Meaning what? The sexually immoral people of the church, the people that are in the church, supposed Christians that are, that are doing these things, don't even keep company with them. Oh, but that's division, Marty. That, that, that's division. And all division is of the devil. Well, I don't think all division is of the devil, actually. Uh, Paul's telling you right here, divide yourself from those people. Don't even eat with those people. Don't hang out with those people. Don't be around those people is what the Word of God says. That is not division. It's called righteousness. All right. Now, 
yes, this stuff boils my blood a little bit. Absolutely, 100%. Because there's so much fallacy in churches today, in ministries today. There's so much hypocrisy. There's so much wrongdoing. But we can't know anybody after the flesh. I'm God's anointed. You can't touch God's anointed. All this different stuff. I've seen such things, such amazingly disgusting vile things coming out of even in churches actually in Africa and places like that they're they're it's unbelievable what happens there and i see this stuff and it it it's it's like i don't know how they're even allowed to continue on. I know the devil keeps them going because it's certainly not God, but they do it for sexual perversion and they do it for money. It's what happens all the time. Why do you think there's so much uh, warning in here about sexually immoral people in the church and, and all these different things. You, you can clearly see that. Anyway, verse 10 says, Yet I did not mean the sexually immoral people of this world or the covetous or the covetous or extortioners or the idolaters. Why? You would need to go out of the world. If you tried to get rid of the sexually immoral people or stay away from the sexually immoral people, the covetous, the extortioners, the idolaters, you would need to leave the world. Why? Because they're everywhere. Right? But, verse 11, I have written to you not to keep company with any man who is called a brother. So now you see where the dividing line is. Who is sexually immoral or covetous, covetous means eager, eager for gain or a defrauder. Okay, there's a lot of that in the body of Christ as well. Or an idolater or a reveler or a drunkard or an extortioner. Do not even eat with such a person. Well, that's division, Marty. Really now? Hmm, I, I, I don't see that. Um... I, I can literally hear voices in, well, Marty hears voices in his head. No, uh, the voices of people saying, well, that's division, Marty. No, according to this, it's righteousness. According to this, it's biblical to not even eat with such a person. A person who calls his uh, brother, who does these things, don't even eat with them. Don't hang out with them. Don't do them. Turn them over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Isn't that a, such a contrast to how we look at things in the church today? This is right that is wrong. All right. Now, verse 12, for what have I to do with judging those who are outside? Do you not judge those who are on inside? Wow. Isn't that interesting? Nobody can judge me, but God. Hmm. Well, Paul just, again, Paul didn't get the memo. For what do I have to do with judging those who are outside? I don't judge the outside world. The outside world is the outside world, but do you not judge those who are inside? Isn't that your job, to take care of one another, to be one another's brother, to, to correct one another, to um, help somebody who's fallen back into, into sin? It's, it's amazing. But God judges those who are out. I'm just reading scripture. God judges those who are outside. Therefore, so because you're supposed to judge what's going on the inside, God will judge what's going on the outside. Put away from you, among, put away from among amongst yourselves that wicked person. Hmm. So according to this, we're not supposed to have anything to do with a wicked person who calls himself a brother. Huh. Well, okay. Matthew 18, 15 through 19. Now, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he doesn't listen, don't worry. Don't know man, don't, we're not supposed to know any man after the flesh. I mean, come on. But if he does not listen, then take with you one or two others, that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Wait a minute, that's gossip. Hmm. That, that, actually, that's slander too. Um, geez, again, Matthew got it wrong here. I, I, don't, I don't know what to do. We're going to have to reword the Bible, I think. Uh, I think we're going to have to change some things up here because this is just, uh, just not accurate to... Um, to what the way things operate is not is not what the Bible says. What does it say? Go to him alone. See, people always think and they they say that you can only go to him and to him. Let's say it's a, it's a it's a person. It's a, your brother. Okay, you go to him and you can only ever go to him. That's not what the Bible says. That's what you do first. Okay. And if they don't listen, you take two or three witnesses so that every word can be established. If that doesn't happen, and if he refuses to listen the first time and the second time, what do you do? You tell it to the church. But wait a minute. Again, that's gossip. And God hates gossip. Oh, he does. But he loves righteousness. Anyway, but if he refuses to listen even to the church, 
don't worry about it. We're not to know any man after the flesh. You tried your best. No. If he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. Meaning what? <laughs> Out you go. Verse 18. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Isn't that interesting that this is right in the same area as Matthew ch chapter 18 talking about church discipline? Is, isn't that amazing? Whatever you bind on earth. See, we use that for casting out devils, for, for sickness, disease, and it's true. Whatever you, you bind, you know, whatever you loose or allow or permit or whatever the case may be or, or forbid. But in context, it's talking about whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven in church discipline. If you allow this stuff to go on in church, you're going to have problems. But if you bind it, it's already unrighteousness is already bound in heaven. But if you let it go in church, it's just going to run wild. You, you see, it's amazing how people pull that one verse 18 right out. But in context, it's talking about um, going to a brother, correcting him, telling it to the church. And if they don't listen to any of that stuff, get them on out of there. It's amazing. Verse 19, again, I say to you that if two or of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it shall be done by my Father who is in heaven. Now, there are four, really uh, four steps to church discipline here. I, I kind of covered them, but we'll go over them quickly. Number one, settle all personal differences by yourself if possible. Okay. Number two, confirm your personal efforts by two or three witnesses. Like I've gone to this guy. I've, I, I, I've done this. Um, they're not listening. This person is not who you think they are. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm establishing this in front of two or three witnesses. Number three, take the stubborn and for unforgiving brother before the church. And if he refuses all means of reconciliation, um, let him be excommunicated. Right? So, so you take the, the stubborn and unforgiving brother before the church. That would really be step three. Step four really would be if he refuses all means of reconciliation, let him be excommunicated. Isn't that just amazing? So if a person is ahead of a ministry and you can't excommunicate them out of their own ministry or church, what do you do? You pack up ship and you get out of there as quickly as possible. Now, uh, there's seven reasons for excommunication out of a church. Number one, sin and being unforgiving. Number two, you have to go back and watch this again to get it because I'm going to go through these quickly. Number two, false doctrine and offenses contrary to scripture. Number three, hating Christ. Well, how can you go to Christ, uh, church and hate Christ? People do it all the time. Number four, disorderly conduct. Hmm, isn't that interesting? But I thought we were supposed to know no man after the flesh. Number five, apostasy. Now, I know I keep hitting that in a, in a joking you know, manner. I know I keep doing that, but I'm trying to show that's not what that verse is, is, is used for, okay? Uh, that's not what that verse is really talking about at all in any way to let people get away with whatever they want and you can't know me after the flesh because then you're carnal. It's so stupid. Anyway, number five, apostasy. Number six, heresy. And number seven, fornication and other sins that damn the soul. There are seven reasons for excommunication. Okay? Now, we're going to look at another one, another few things here, and then we're going to let you go. 1 Timothy 5, 19 through 20. Do not receive an accusation against an elder, except before two or three witnesses. There it is again, just like Matthew chapter 18. Verse 20 rebuke in the presence of everyone those who sin that the rest may also fear. Isn't that, oh, Marty, that's division. Marty, that's gossip. Marty, that's slander. Really, then why does it say that? Rebuke in the presence of, I'm just reading it slowly to make sure I'm not missing anything here. Rebuke in the presence of everyone those who sin. So you take the people who are willfully habitual sinning who will not comply with the rules of church discipline, Matthew chapter 18, that I just read out to you, and if they refuse it, you excommunicate them, but you can also take them in the presence of everyone and rebuke them in the presence of everyone, those who are in sin. Why? So that the rest of the people that are seeing this will live in fear. Isn't that just amazing? But but again, that's, that's no, Marty, that's division, that's 
gossip, that's slander. We got to handle everything behind closed doors. Uh, that's exactly where these people want you, you to handle it is behind closed doors. Why? Because in front of this camera, we can be whatever we want to be, but behind the camera, behind closed doors, that's where the problem is. And there's many people who will say, well, I can't get near to anybody because people always hurt me and do all these different things. Well, maybe that's because when people get near you, they actually see who you are and that's why they leave. Hmm, isn't that interesting? Now, last set of scriptures, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6. Now, we commend you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother. <laughs> Division. No righteousness. Now, we command you, not suggest, brothers, we command you in what? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourself from every brother who walks in idleness and not according to the tradition that is received from us. Why? Because when you get near them, you will become like them and you will start to compromise your righteousness, your holiness, your walk with God, your faith, and you'll start, your eyes will start to get blind and your, your soul will start to be seared. Your, your mind, your conscience will be seared to what's happening. And I'm just earning a paycheck or whatever the case may be. I just want to be around this great person of God. If they're doing these things, they're not a great person of God. Get away from them. Leave. Well, you, you don't understand. I got to be here for a paycheck, you're going to answer for that. Simple as that. Now, I'm just going to look at a couple of hypothetical situations here, okay? And just to say, you know, use that, you know, no, no man after the flesh thing. If a minister never pays taxes on, on book sales, employees tax, personal tax, uh, is that okay because we are to know no man after the flesh? No, the Bible says to pay Caesar what is Caesar's, right? So if, if a person avoids, um, you know, the, the Canada Revenue Agency or they avoid the IRS or something like that by, by uh, not putting, paying the taxes or, or not paying taxes or not having proper payroll and things like that, uh, that's okay. It, we're not to know any man after the flesh, you know, hypothetically speaking, of course. If a minister uh, often maybe a a a empties a bank account um, and, and takes the money for themselves, that's, that, that's okay because we are to know no man after the flesh. Sure. Okay. If a minister repeatedly, repeatedly lies over and over again, um, and, and is known for that, that yeah, should be okay because we really know no man after the flesh. If a minister, you know, goes to, you know, what people call red light districts and, 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 you know, and hanging out with unsavory people, not for the sake of the gospel, but for the sake of perversion, like going to like a strip club or something, that's okay. We should not know any man after the flesh. You know, no, people's actions speak louder than words. We have seen people stealing money from churches, emptying out bank accounts. They, they, they have, um, uh, I, I've watched how, you know, uh, the, the tithe or an offering would come in and the, a pastor's kids would, would just take the money, put an envelope and he would stick it in his pocket and then he would lie to the church and nothing came in. We've seen all these different things, but I'm just speaking hypothetically, of course. So um, anyway, listen. I, I care about the holiness and the righteousness of the church. If we don't have it, then what's the difference between us and the world? There's so many reasons why people get turned away from the church. And one of them is because they see this in ministers. People know that... I have a, a friend who, who's been coming out to our, our church out here that we just started, which is going amazing, by the way. And we have unsaved people inviting unsaved people to the church. And there's stories of forgiveness between Christians and non-Christians. And I mean, all this stuff, it's, it's just been amazing. But he, he told me he walked into a church one time, um, not that long ago, and because he was kind of trying out different churches in town and things like that. And he went to church and he immediately knew something was up. And and he, he, con he confronted... Uh, after a little bit of time of being there, he actually went and asked the pastor, is this happening? Is this thing happening? And they, they denied it or whatever the case may be. So they stayed going, but they knew something. This man knew something in his spirit. The Holy Spirit revealed it to him that something was just wrong. And it turned out a few months later, it found out that the head of this church the, was having an affair with a church member or church staff member or something of that nature. I don't know them. I don't know anything about them. Uh, but that's what happened. Should he just stay there and not know man and know any man after the flesh? 
Well, he's just struggling a little bit. Absolutely not. The Bible says, get out of there, get out of there. Why? Because it's going to draw you down too. And what you, what you stick around, you become responsible for. And you are ultimately a partaker of that thing. And people would say, well, no, I'm just here for a paycheck. No, you're helping that thing move forward. Listen, I know this was strong preaching. I know this, you know, might not sit well with people, but... If this is the way ministries have to be run, I'm out. Done. I'm out. But it's not. So we're in. You see? Um, it's just amazing. This, this week alone, something um, took place and, and, and God, God clearly spoke and he said, by these things happening, you have now stepped into your apostolic calling. Amazing. It, it, it's 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 just incredible what's what's happening with us. So guys, anyway, I've kept you way longer than I anticipated. These are supposed to be thirty minute sessions. It's now been fifty four minutes, but great things are happening here. We have many things on the horizon. Um, if you have not downloaded our app, go to Raise Ministries International um, uh, on whatever. Um, Play Store or App Store or whatever it's called, you might have to use the acronym like A dot or R dot A dot and all that kind of stuff to actually find it. We've had quite a few people, lots of people, a lot more than I thought actually, download our, our app. Um, you are able to ha send in a prayer request, watch our podcast, um, watch videos. You're able to sow into the ministry, become a partner with us, all these different things. And we want to be able to communicate with people on our app. So make sure that you turn on your notifications. Um, and because uh, we've got a lot of good things in the work. We're working on our fall schedule already. We've got a couple of things coming up here in the next couple of weeks that I'll be attending. Uh, plus the church we got going here. We just opened a church in the Czech Republic, a raised international church in the Czech Republic. Uh, we've got a great bunch of kids, great bunch of leaders there. I call them kids. They're not, they're not you know, 15 years old or anything, but I call them kids because they're, they're younger than me and they're just a great bunch of kids and we're going to be seeing them shortly. Uh, we talk to them on a regular basis and just love them. They're doing a great work over there. So stay tuned for uh, for some things out of that. Uh, we have another church that we've talked to about uh, coming on board with us. Uh, it's just it, it really exciting things. We're, we're trying to just keep one foot in front of the other and keep moving forward. So guys, join along with us. Follow us, like and share this video, subscribe to this, follow us on social media, download the app. And again, if you want to become a partner with it, with us for to do all these things, to plant church and things, we'd highly appreciate that. So anyway, God bless you. If you're interested in that, you can do it off the app and you can go to our website at raiseministries.com and there's places to do all those different things and see everything that we're doing, all right? Another thing we're doing is working on a bunch of one-day seminars. Um, so some people can't do a three-day seminar, so we're working on a bunch of one-day seminars. So stay tuned for that as well. God bless you guys. Thank you for, for uh, being with us and, and, and uh, watching this video. I love you guys. We just want, we want righteousness and holiness in the church. But if, if the person, listen, everything flows downhill. Right. So we, if, if the person at the top is, is living like this and saying like this and, and being a hypocrite, it's all going to flow down hill and it's going to affect anybody. Listen, you can't stand below a mudslide and the mudslide comes down and you not be covered with mud. Of course you will. Even if you're on the outskirts of that, you're going to get hit by a little bit of mud. So anyway, God bless you guys. Thank you for tuning in. Um, it's important to know what scripture actually says. Okay. God bless you. We'll see you again soon. Bye bye for now.